Welcome to Queue Up. My guest is the mayor of the city of Spokane, Mary Verner. She's the 43rd mayor, and I just found out that since 1881, when the city of Spokane had mayors, she is now our third female mayor. So welcome Mary Verner on Queue Up. Thank you, Brenda. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I wanted to have this opportunity since you still are pretty fresh in the office of mayor. Here we are in January. Well, no, February, aren't we? We've made it through January. We've made it past Groundhog Day. And one of the worst winters we've had in a mm -hmm. while, too, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about a little later, I think, in the program. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're past the first hundred days. Actually, I'm not quite past not, the first hundred days yet. I'm enjoying every day, though. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. exciting. I love the variety. I love the challenges. And most of all, I love the opportunity to be able to effect change here in the city. Now, can you share with us a little bit about yourself, um, mother, grandmother, how yeah. you feel that now, in the office of mayor, you can affect some change. You can leave a legacy behind. Absolutely. Well, being a mother and a grandmother really motivates me every day to think mm -hmm. about the future. If there's one thing that really makes uh, uh, a face on the future, it's looking mm -hmm. in the faces of your children and grandchildren. So they motivate me every day to think way past today and way past my term in office and try to make every day meaningful for when they accept responsibility for management of this city. And it is their city. It's the beautiful near nature, near perfect Spokane, and it's our job during my generation to make sure that they inherit a community that is worth living in and that really lives up to that name. So I do yeah. have two grandchildren. Um, I adore them, Bariah, who just mm -hmm. turned five, and Elijah, who just turned three. And I have a 27-year-old daughter, her husband Jeremy, living here in Spokane. And then I still have a child at home. I have a 10-year-old, mm -hmm. my son Daniel, who's in the fourth grade. So you're still doing not only the grandparenting, which is a remarkable time in, in my life, I know, mm -hmm. and a whole new dimension, but the parenting as well. I love it, absolutely. And the children help me to maintain balance in my life mm -hmm. and remind me of what's important. So sometimes I can you know, get my priorities a little bit skewed according to what's happening at work. And again, they help me to really remain grounded. Um, my grandchildren have kept me more active, and I can tell you look very fit and youthful still, so yeah. they're amazing. But more than that, they do inspire us, don't they? They do. To really try to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking back in our generation and seeing where we weren't as conscientious as mm -hmm. now. We have a lot more information about what's going on on the planet mm -hmm. and what we can do even at a city level. Right. What would you like to see with your environmental background, mm -hmm. too? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you bring a lot of those issues forward because you have a good understanding of the needs of basically the planet, too. Right. I, I have a good understanding, and I'm, I'm growing impatient. We've known for decades now that we've had mm -hmm. far too big of an impact on our environment. And I think today we're facing the consequences of ignoring the immediacy of addressing that. Now we really do have urgent situations. In 1969, the passage mm -hmm. of the National Environmental Policy Act on a federal level, which should have been a good wake-up call to us as a country, now it's 2008. Uh, and so yes, I'm, right. I'm really uh, eager to be aggressive about mm -hmm. the way we pursue environmental cleanup. And of course, over those decades, I too have matured and developed a broader understanding of what it takes. Most of what I've learned is that what makes good sense for the environment also makes good sense for the economy. So as the mayor mm -hmm. of the city of Spokane, I'm really looking to build an economic sector and to make the business case for why we need to address our environmental issues and we need to do it right now. I believe the city of Spokane has one of the most remarkable models of an ability to take an old building and renovate it mm -hmm. using, you know, old timber, recycle as much as possible, mm -hmm. even with uh, using water that was available running underground, uh, mm -hmm. the solar panels. And people I know are coming from other cities mm -hmm. to look at what the city of Spokane through the community building and the Serenac project have accomplished mm -hmm. in terms of being more eco-friendly. Right. Uh, do you see in this redevelopment phase that the city has been under going, adding any more, you know, expansion to that whole green concept? Absolutely. In fact, let me brag about a few other projects here mm -hmm. in Spokane. The Saranac building and the community building are private projects with office space in them. We have 
public projects I'd like to highlight as well. Mm -hmm. Our convention center is a LEED certified building as well. It was built to uh, environmental standards and that's a public gathering place. The Spokane Falls Community College just built a brand new building for their business college and it also is a LEED certified building. In fact, the name of the building is Sunwayman, which is a Salish word for a gathering place to do commerce and in respect for the native heritage of the area, oh, they also beautiful. made it an mm -hmm. ecologically sound building. So we have a gathering place mm -hmm. for the public in the convention center. We have a classroom building. We have an office building. We have new buildings that are residential structures mm -hmm. that really accommodate the green building concepts. And then we also have a manufacturing facility right in downtown Spokane. Blu-ray Disc right. has a manufacturing uh -huh. facility in which they have put their heat generating equipment in the basement mm -hmm. so that the natural cooling effect of the ground and of the ground water can um, help cool their equipment. And then the excess heat, of course, helps to heat the upper floors. They've renovated that building with green technology in mind, too. So we have numerous examples here in Spokane. I, I'm very proud to mention mm -hmm. those now, you know, whenever I go and say I'm from Spokane. And so we will continue to talk about some of the issues okay. as mayor of the city of Spokane. Good. We're going to continue to talk with the city of Spokane mayor Mary Verner, and we're going to uh, tackle some of these really hard issues that mayors have to deal with every day. Well, um, Mayor Verner, a couple issues. Uh, one is this uh, situation that the downtown Spokane has displaced quite a few of the very low income people, mm -hmm. and developers are now going to really upscale those buildings and not really provide low income housing. Mm -hmm. What's the city's responsibility? or maybe with just what's your input mm -hmm. and insight into how we can deal with that? Uh, the displacement of low-income tenants is uh, really an artifact of our success. Mm -hmm. And we have to have both. We really do have to continue to encourage a vibrant downtown Spokane that mm -hmm. encourages folks who can afford high-income condominiums. And we also have to take care of those who cannot afford that. We have a big homelessness problem here in Spokane. In fact, I think most major urban areas have a big homelessness problem. I but do this remember is where we provide a figure the services. of over a thousand, which shocked me. In over Spokane, a thousand homeless people. We've just completed another updated homeless count, and mm -hmm. I don't have the information yet on what our count was this year. We provide a lot of services here, mm -hmm. so in some ways it's a, um, a vicious cycle. But this is an urban center for mm -hmm. the inland northwest. So our challenge really is to make sure that we have that right mix of housing stock in downtown. Mm -hmm. We really cannot afford as a community to replicate services all over town, nor would that really be an efficient or wise thing to do. So our real challenge has been to provide the units that people could move into. And last summer's crisis in downtown Spokane was not only a wake-up call, but it was a call to action. Mm -hmm. So we have numerous actions that are being pursued right now in the city of Spokane. There's the regulatory approach, and there is a draft tenant relocation ordinance that's making its way through legal review, city council consideration, and may be put on the, the council's docket for action later this year. Under the ordinance approach, a property owner who converts low, low income housing to expensive housing mm -hmm. and displaces those tenants would be required to help with the relocation expenses. Under a state law in the state of Washington that, that is a tool available to us, it also is a challenge for us because the city government has to come up with a match to the private developer's contribution. Oh, so okay. we mm -hmm. have, of course, a strapped mm -hmm. general fund budget, yeah. but it's, a, it's something that we are exploring for consideration. So that's the regulatory approach. The other is an incentive approach and a partnership mm -hmm. approach, which is very, working very well in Spokane. I'm proud to say that we have not only private 